Suzanne, are you guys ready to go? Okay. We'll call the meeting back to order. Back to agenda item 14, reports informational. Item A, department activity report. Secretary Wasley, Director Wasley will provide a report on recent department activities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's report is relatively brief. Uh, I'll just start with the uh, game division. The game division was represented and attended several committee and working group meetings at the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, annual meeting in Sandy, Utah during the September uh, 11th through the 13th. Uh, the game division administrator chaired the Human Wildlife Conflict Working Group and represented the department at meetings of the Science and Research Committee, the Sustainable Use of Wildlife Committee, Wildlife Resources and Policy Committee, and Harvest Information Program Working Group. Game Division and Habitat Division staff met with representatives from an Elko Mining Company to discuss potential impacts and mitigation to a proposed above ground conveyor belt system associated with the Mount Hamilton Gold Mine. The proposed conveyor belt would completely bisect some mule deer travel corridors and potentially influence sage grouse lacks. Staff agreed to research possible crossing structures as a form of mitigation. Wildlife health staff are preparing for hunting season by requesting samples from taxidermists as well as hunters uh, for samples from bighorn sheep for respiratory disease, pneumonia, and sinus tumor, and from deer and elk for chronic wasting disease surveillance. Um, just kind of as a, as a side note, I would like to to share with the commission um, that CWD, chronic wasting disease, uh, continues to uh, expand and, and show increased uh, prevalence in certain parts of the country. Although we still have not documented it in, in Nevada, we've fallen short of our sampling target. So this year we're gonna reach out to taxidermists or we have already reached out to taxidermists uh, and some meat processors. We're actually uh, offering a, a small uh, financial incentive to uh, taxidermists, uh, limited the total number of samples that they can submit, but trying to get over that 300 sample mark. Uh, the, the research around CWD uh, continues to concern those in the, the wildlife and human health professions. Uh, the prion has been found in the soil, it's been found incorporated in plant material, and it's been uh, now documented to uh, also uh, exist in, uh, or at least be transmissible to uh, primates. So there continues to be a significant concern around the future of CWD. And with the uh, commission's discretion, uh, some future meeting, perhaps even as, as soon as November, uh, maybe, maybe we could wait, see how many samples we come up with, but we would like to share um, a little bit more information to keep that on your radar. And again, we haven't detected it, uh, but we'll continue uh, some pretty rigorous monitoring efforts. Uh, wildlife Health and other game division staff have been collecting and testing DNA from homes where any bear has entered in search of food. These samples are compared with uh, bears trapped in uh, nearby neighborhoods to ensure identification of offending animals that may be captured uh, subsequently. Wildlife health staff assisted in the response to a die-off of waterfowl and other water birds which occurred on Carson Lake. Mortalities were recovered and submitted for diagnostic testing. Botulism was the cause of the die-off which involved approximately 100 waterfowl. Wildlife health specialists 
co-organized the third captive pet tortoise sterilization clinic, which was held on August 29th and 30th in Vegas. Veterinarians from many states participated in the training effort and 103 pet tortoises from Nevada, including one of the governor's first tortoises, uh, was sterilized. All animals received health exams and permanent identification. The clinic is a collaborative effort by Clark County, the Department of Wildlife, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to prevent uncontrolled captive breeding and potential release of unwanted surplus pets into the wild. Wildlife health staff conducted a capture class for biologists and law enforcement officers on September 14th. Also in Vegas, the class trained staff on the use of pharmaceuticals and techniques to safely immobilize wildlife. The Fisheries Division, Nevada Aquatic Invasive Species Plan approved by this commission in August is undergoing final formatting and we expect the final plan to be presented to the governor for review and signature uh, next week. Fisheries Division is trying to resolve a potential shortage of rainbow trout eggs for 2018 production. Uh, I just uh, had a conversation with Fisheries Division Administrator John Schoberg and uh, we have found some additional eggs in anticipation that the egg take from Marlette Lake would be limited because of the conditions last winter. We had secured 250,000 eggs from Ennis National Fish Hatchery in May in Montana. When the eggs arrived at the Gallagher Hatchery in Ruby Valley, the shipping containers had been damaged by FedEx and almost all the eggs were lost. Uh, we've since uh, located an additional uh, private supplier for eggs and replaced those 250,000 eggs. Um, the uh, damage, the, the shipping was paid for by Ennis and the state of Nevada did not have to pay for those 250,000 eggs. However, um, the quarter million that will be replacing those from a private vendor will need to be paid for. Staff are working with the National Park Service for approval of plans to resolve the problems with the fire suppression system at Lake Mead Hatchery. The current system is contaminated with quagga mussels from the wa raw water supply. This will bring the hatchery into compliance with fire codes and possibly allow reopening of the visitor center. We've received several reports of localized fish kills in Lahontan Reservoir, mostly juvenile carp, but also white bass, crappie, and wiper. We're monitoring water quality in the reservoir, but the problem may be in part because of vegetation that grew up the past few years and is now submerged and decaying, resulting in local areas of an anoxic water. A fish salvage below the spillway at South Fork Reservoir has confirmed several age classes of yellow perch, along with channel catfish, largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, bluegill, sunfish, and, and wipers. Yellow perch were first found below the spillway in 2016. Several important genetics projects for native fish species are, are progressing, including a range-wide assessment of alvor chub in northwestern Nevada and Oregon, and an evaluation of range-wide genetics of relic dace in northeastern Nevada through UC Davis. The relic dace work is important relative, relative to an existing petition to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to list the dace in Goshoot Valley under the Endangered Species Act. A petition from the Center for Biological Diversity to emergency list the Dixie Valley toad under the Endangered Species Act was received by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on Monday, September 19th. This was not unexpected. The primary threat identified is construction of a geothermal plant in Dixie Valley. Fishery staff has been working with the Fish and Wildlife Service to ensure they have all available information on the toad to use in evaluating the petition for the initial 90-day finding. Fishery staff, with assistance from the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Forest Service, has completed a major treatment project to remove non-native trout from about 24 miles of the North Fork Humboldt River and tributaries. This will allow re-establishment of native Lahontan cutthroat trout to almost the entire North Fork sub-basin. Through the end of August, we've documented at least six northern pike from Cummins Lake, all in the same six to nine inch size range. Anglers have reported to our creel clerk catching several other pike that weren't turned in, but were discovered, or excuse me, were disposed of and not released. We'll continue intensive boat electrofishing surveys in September and October to see if additional pike can be located and removed. In the habitat division, uh, given this million acre plus wildfire season, regional staff are working with the BLM to address fire rehab rehabilitation needs associated with 2017 fires. Although we're currently waiting on the BLM to provide indication of funding approvals for the various ESR emergency uh, stabilization plans, uh, we have already started our seed purchase process. Endow, in cooperation with many sportsmen's groups, has pooled monies and resources to try to meet priority wildlife 
habitat rehabilitation needs on public, private, and state-owned property. Uh, of that, in excess of a million acres that burned, uh, approximately 934,000 acres of sage-grouse habitat uh, was lost. Um, by far the largest uh, acreage lost in, in the West this year. Endow is in contract on a property acquisition adjacent to Overton Wildlife Management Area. The 13-acre property includes two ponds, totaling approximately four acres in size, plus a residence. The ponds currently serve as important resting habitat for waterfowl and will be maintained uh, through use of some previously purchased water rights. As part of the Sentinel Landscapes Partnership Collaborative, the Habitat Division continues to investigate possible conservation easement opportunities. During uh, the time since application submission, the Habitat Division has provided updates, including monthly interagency meetings and the National Re Nat Natural Resource Conservation Service Conservation Easement Workshop held in Reno on September 12th. Uh, through the Habitat Division's Private Lands for Wildlife Program, work continues with the State Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, State Conservation Commission, and the Conservation Districts Program as well as U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Partners for Fish and Wildlife, uh, all to develop and implement habitat restoration projects on private lands across the state. Endow recently <coughs> provided financial match for conservation district projects in Elko, Washoe, and Lyon counties, complementing funds provided by the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection, BLM, and the NRCS. Construction has begun on a wetland enhancement project at the Key Pittman Wildlife Management Area, Endow has partnered with Ducks Unlimited on this project to rehabilitate portions of the North Ponds, resulting in more uniform wetlands that eliminate uh, overly deep areas and spread water to areas that in the present state do not support shallow ponded conditions. The project will also replace water control structures to improve water delivery and drainage, providing improved overall habitat management ability. Eagle View contractors out of Moapa was awarded the construction contract and the project is expected to be completed before the October 14th waterfowl opener. Habitat Division staff continue to work with the Nevada Division of Water Resources and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service staff on a temporary water transfer to send water purchased for Carson Lake to Stillwater National Wildlife Refuge to benefit wildlife and waterfowl hunting on the refuge. Due to the amount of runoff from last winter, Endow does not have a need to send water out to Carson Lake since most of the levees and roads remain underwater on that area. The law enforcement division, conflicts between bears and humans continue to escalate along the Sierra Front and then the Tahoe Basin. An Incliden Village man confronted a bear in his kitchen in the early morning hours of September 6th. The bear reportedly charged the man who shot it with a 9mm handgun. The bear then turned and fled from the house, leaving blood evidence in the house and down the street. Endow game wardens tracked the bear for several hours, but eventually lost the trail. A California man was injured by a bear in a similar incident in Tahoe City in late August. This encounter also happened inside the man's residence and is the most serious injuries we've heard of in the Tahoe Basin in recent years. Also on September 6th, Southern Region game wardens investigated a boating fatality near Sentinel Island at Lake Mead. A 63-year-old male drowned after jumping into the water to swim with no flotation device. Lake Mead Game Wardens conducted an uh, operating under the influence checkpoint at Colville Bay Marina on August 19th that netted one arrest for boating under the influence. Following this checkpoint was a busy Labor Day holiday on the southern Nevada waters, signaling the tail end of the 2017 boating season. Eastern Region Game Wardens recently filed charges against two Utah guides for guiding without a license. This case is one of several that stemmed from a flurry of elk poaching cases investigated in 2015 and 2016 in the extreme northeast corner of Nevada. Charges are pending in several other guide cases from around the state, including two unrelated cases of guiding on Forest Service land without a Forest Service permit, and a third case for taking payment for a hunt without a contract in place and then reneging on the hunt arrangement without refunding the hunt money. Western Region Game Wardens noted the issuance of several uh, unplugged shotgun citations in early September for the dove season opener, but dove numbers uh, seemed low. Several concentrated patrol efforts are scheduled for the busiest hunt locations this fall. These include saturation patrols, highway checkpoints, and unit watches. 
with small staff of game wardens, huge patrol areas to cover, and greatly increased tag numbers compared to 10 years ago. These concentrated patrol efforts may net more bang for the buck than routine patrols. Two personal watercraft patrol courses are scheduled in the southern region. One is a two-day operator's course, and the other is a three-day instructor's course for boating safety patrols conducted on jet skis. Uh, lastly, from the law enforcement division, a personnel matter, after 15 years of service to the law enforcement division, uh, Ed Lingard has retired from state service to pursue such noble interests as a radio show, teaching English at the community college, and raising children. Ed was the boating education coordinator and public information officer for the law enforcement division. His public relations work and large personality will be missed. The Wildlife Diversity Division this past August found the Diversity Division participating in the annual Bat Blitz. This year, this week's long survey effort was focused on the Takima and Monitor Ranges in Central Nevada. There were 37 participants representing five agencies, Bat researchers, consultants, and volunteers who spent four nights surveying a total of 10 sites and six different habitat types. Surveys were conducted using a combination of mist nets and recording of bat echolocation calls with acoustic bat detectors. Despite a week of thunderstorms that hampered the study at times, survey crews managed to trap 11 species, totaling 398 bats. Pending analysis of the acoustic data, the total number of species detected will likely increase because usually there are a few species that are difficult or impossible to capture in nets, but which are easily detected acoustically. Of the bats caught, the most excitement came from a capture of a spotted bat and a western red bat. These two species are notoriously difficult to trap. While we've detected these species acoustically, we've yet to catch them. It took 150 meters of net to catch the spotted bat, and it turned out to be a lactating female, which provides conclusive evidence that there's a breeding population in this area. In addition to the bats, one survey crew caught a flammulated owl, a designated species of conservation priority in the Wildlife Action Plan. This represents the first time the species was observed within the monitor range despite surveys being conducted in 2005. In the western and eastern regions, biologists are conducting fall pica surveys along the Ruby Pipeline and within the Black Rock, High Rock areas, working on analyzing summer bat acoustic data from several endow water development sites, tracking satellite tag northern goshawks, continuing surveys on western pond turtles, and collaborating with two universities on genetic analysis of several species of shrews. The Conservation Education Division, Conservation Education staff uh, also uh, had a, a attendance at the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, annual meeting in Utah. Staff participated in the committee and working groups of education, outreach, and diversity, hunting and shooting sports participation, education, angling, and boating uh, participation committees. Staff attended the governor's tour of the Walker River State Recreational Area, Nevada's newest state park. Education staff coordinated and began the planning process to include angling, shotgun, archery, and interpretive tours. Endow plans on taking a significant role in planning activities for this park. Conservation education staff held interviews for the Western Region Conservation Education Supervisor and statewide volunteer program and wildlife education coordinator positions located in, in Reno. Those positions uh, were Chris Healy's position, Kim Toulouse's position. Desert wildlife uh, outreach activity was conducted by the wildlife education coordinator at Lake Mead Visitor Center, as well as scheduling the first osprey walk of the year at the Wells Trailhead for September 17th. Um, this was a joint effort with staff from the Clark County Wetlands Park. Conservation education staff has combined resources with other Nevada Department of Wildlife divisions in several ways, including coordinating a bitterbrush seed uh, planning with Habitat Division, along with Great Basin Institute, Keep Truckee Meadows Beautiful, AmeriCorps, and the Nevada Conservation Corps for National Community Service Day on September 11th. Staff worked with local TV, radio, and newspaper outlets in cooperation with Diversity Division and the Nevada Department of Agriculture on a presentation given to teachers at Grammar Number no. 2 on bats and rabies, and also uh, conducted some Living with Urban Coyote seminars. Uh, they were held in Reno on August 14th and Las Vegas August 16th. These seminars are a joint effort involving representatives from conservation education and game divisions, uh, as well as uh, USDA APHIS Wildlife Services. They were attended by uh, 16 and 57 people, respectively, 
animal rights community is, was well represented as were those who would like to see more aggressive management by the agencies. The Data Information and Technology Division, NDOW continues to work with Calcomai Enterprises LLC to develop the new agency management system, AMS, that will manage our customer database, internal and licensed agent point of sale platform, and volunteer tracking system. All licensed office and regional counter staff are engaged and eager to implement the new platform. Regional counter staff are preparing for a more direct uh, licensed agent support, both in implementing the new system and the license simplification changes coming in 2018 and maintaining relationships uh, with the department. The GIS program staff is working on uh, quality assurance, quality control for all Guzzler locations for the new third edition of the Water Development Atlas to be printed this fall. 2016-17 uh, winter raptor survey data is being QAQC'd from last year's survey effort and uh, new mobile data collection tools are being developed to test for this year's effort. Mapping projects include updated maps for wildlife management areas, habitat restoration project maps, mapping recent wildfires in the context of Endow projects, and analyzing greater sage-grouse movement patterns in the vicinity of the McGinnis Hills geothermal plant. The division is finalizing the deployment of Microsoft Office 365 that supports cloud-hosted document sharing and collaboration. And lastly, the license office has issued approximately 300 deer and pronghorn damage compensation tags, 75 uh, elk incentive tags, 200 swan permits, and are currently processing uh, approximately 1,000 returned big game tags to date. Uh, that concludes the report, department activity report from the uh, seven divisions. Uh, the director's office, I will cover some of, uh, some of our recent activities and uh, the next couple items, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director Wosley. Um, great report, and I always enjoy hearing it, and I'm glad we got it more towards the middle of the meeting instead of at the end when we're the only people here. <laughs> so thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Director Wosley. We'll move on to agenda item 14B, Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies Conference Report, Secretary Wosley and Deputy Attorney General Joshua Woodbury. Director Wosley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As indicated in the Department Activity Report, the uh, Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies annual meeting was held uh, last week uh, in Sandy, Utah. Uh, roughly 600 people attend that meeting. It's a meeting attended um, by all 50 states, uh, several Canadian provinces. Um, it's a, uh, we, we had a pretty uh, strong representation uh, from all of our uh, division administrators and, and some other uh, affected staff. The theme of this year's conference was through the looking glass um, and that was reflected in the uh, plenary session. Um, Richard Childress of NASCAR, uh, Childress Racing, um, Bruce Culpepper, the president of Shell Oil and uh, a third individual, and uh, name escapes me, who owns an outdoor uh, supply company, um, basically provided their perspective on uh, conservation and collaborative conservation. Um, the, the idea of through the looking glass was an, intended to give uh, conservation professionals and, and wildlife professionals a perspective of those um, who maybe aren't uh, working directly in our field, but, but see us from from industry, um, had some in, in, in very interesting and in, in, intriguing interactions uh, with some of those individuals. The uh, schedule is is loaded. Uh, you heard several of the meetings in the department activity report. Uh, game division ad administrators that included those meetings in their reports, uh, Wakeling and Vasey uh, each had four or five uh, meetings on top of the, the plenary sessions. Um, we get spread pretty thin uh, while we're there. They have a, a pretty aggressive schedule. Um, the days start early and, and run late. There's a lot of uh, double and, and triple booking, but we try to uh, try to have as much coverage as possible. Um, a lot of the discussion, as some of some of the discussion that I've already mentioned, uh, was relative to CWD, and that's some of the stuff that we'd like to share with you uh, going forward. Uh, but it's a great opportunity. Uh, to understand what other states are uh, 
working with and, and establish some networks and pool, pull some resources. Uh, this meeting, I don't, I don't want to uh, steal um, Dag Woodbury's thunder, but it was a great opportunity uh, to also have Dag Woodbury in, in attendance, and um, I'll let him speak to his experience with the legal committees. And um, but there's there are some issues that uh, Nevada is is not alone in, um, and so I think it was a good opportunity uh, to have him attend and, and participate in in some of those uh, meetings as well. Thank you, Director. Mr. Woodbury. Joshua Woodbury with the uh, Attorney General's Office. Uh, yes, I attended uh, the legal committee meetings and was able to, uh, since I'm new to, new to this position, uh, connect with uh, Deputy Attorney Generals in, in other uh, similarly geographically located uh, areas of Utah, Arizona, Idaho, Wyoming, and talk about uh, matters that, that uh, overlap, uh, such as we've received uh, communications from a, a Northwest Band of Shoshone Indians uh, stating that they have uh, certain hunting rights that they uh, intend on, on exclusively using and covering a five or six uh, state area. And so we were able to discuss how other states are, are dealing with that issue. Um, other legal issues and and participation in uh, in filing amicus briefs for overarching uh, litigation that deals with matters concerning uh, Western states and, and, uh, and other states as well. Um, and so it was a good experience for me to be able to reach out and and uh, meet some of my colleagues and, and discuss how other states are dealing with with some of these common issues. Thank you, Jim. And uh, Director Rosley. Yeah, I would just like to add some of the uh, some of the big ticket items for discussion uh, by the states included uh, modernization of Pittman Robertson, which uh, I've brought before you before, and would allow up to 25 percent of a state's uh, Pittman Robertson to be used uh, towards uh, marketing, recruitment, education. Um, so we continue to discuss that and. Uh, the, there's a pretty uh, strong sense of optimism that we'll uh, see um, passage of that at some point. This Congress was also ESA uh, reform. Um, we continue to, to be engaged uh, on ESA reform. Uh, the meeting was attended by uh, the uh, Deputy Secretary of Interior, David Bernhardt, uh, had the opportunity to uh, speak about uh, some Nevada specific issues with the, with the deputy secretary uh, and the principal deputy director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Greg Sheehan, who attended our executive committee meetings and was also able to um, have some one-on-one -on -one discussions with Greg about uh, Nevada specific issues. And then lastly, the Alliance for America's Fish and Wildlife, which is the, uh, the brand of the Blue Ribbon Panel recommendations um, and the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Um, we have updates on that and continue to remain engaged uh, on that front. Thank you, Director. Deputy Director Rob. Thank you, Chairman Wallace. Uh, one thing that Director Wasley doesn't bring up during these uh, WAFA and AFA updates is his contribution he has at these uh, venues and the respect he's earned at these venues. Uh, Commissioner McNitt sees it. Uh, but I'd be remiss in not bringing it up that uh, Director Wallsley has put us on a whole new uh, level when it comes to Nevada and respect and uh, our voice is being heard. You know, sometimes uh, you still don't get your way, but at least you're listened to and respected, and that uh, is a big accomplishment for such a small state. And uh, a tribute to uh, what Director Wallsey has done for the Department of Wildlife and the citizens of the state of Nevada. So I, I hate to have this go by and not bring that up. Thank you, Deputy Director Rob, and thank you, Director Wallsey, because that, that's great. Comments or questions from the commission? Okay, anything further, guys? Seeing then we'll move to agenda item 14C, litigation report. Deputy Attorney General Joshua Woodbury, a status report on litigation will be provided. 
Actually, this is Brian Stockton. I'll handle that one. Um, you have okay. your report in the materials. The only two updates are on the Truckee River or Truckee Carson Irrigation District litigation. <clears throat> the uh, initially in your report, it talks about the mediation and listen. Initially, we were invited to participate, and then we were disinvited. Um, and apparently, the mediation failed. The panel has issued its decision, found that uh, Truckee Carson Irrigation District should be uh, have to uh, uh, recoup the water to the tribe that was uh, diverted in 1985 and 1986. And the panel, rather than remanding it to the district court, just ordered TCID to uh, to provide um, 8,300 acre feet of water to the tribe to make up for the illegal diversions. <clears throat> the other case that has an update is the Smith versus Wakeling case. That one we have filed a motion to quash service of process um, based on the you know the Nevada. Um, versus California venue that's that case was filed in Truckee and we have argument on that motion on October 23rd in Truckee So that's all I have unless you have questions Questions for mr. Stockton Okay, seeing none. Thank you. Mr. Stockton That will conclude agenda item number 14 we'll close that and move to agenda item number 15 Nevada Department of Wildlife Project update, Secretary Tony Wasley. The commission has requested that the department provide regular project updates for the ongoing projects and programs as appropriate based on geography and timing of meetings. These updates are intended to provide detail in addition to summaries provided as part of the regular department report and are intended to inform the commission and public as the department's ongoing duties and responsibilities. Director Wasley. Thank you, Chairman Wallace. Uh, so consistent with uh, past efforts, uh, you know, we knew we were coming down to Las Vegas for this meeting. Uh, we had a discussion about uh, w what would be an appropriate project update to provide the commission. And uh, one thing that uh, we we thought warranted uh, highlighting was the significant achievement um, in bighorn sheep recovery efforts. So this year we. We passed a significant milestone. We actually uh, achieved in excess of 12,000 bighorn sheep in Nevada, um, largely due to the desert sheep populations that exist in, in this part of the state. And um, it's it's always surprising uh, to folks, in certainly in other Western states, when I when I tell them that Nevada has more bighorn sheep than any other state in the lower 48, uh, and not not by a little bit. Uh, by, by quite a bit, and so we wanted to uh, kind of provide an update on where we are in in our state relative to our bighorn sheep populations, and then uh, do a little bit uh, deeper dive into one of the key factors to that growth and expansion, which is the water development program. So, um, Game Division Administrator Brian Wakeling uh, will provide uh, an update on the status of those populations and, and herds, and then uh, we'll get. Uh, additional presentation from Habitat Staff Specialist Matt Maples on the role of water development in establishing uh, those herds. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director Wasley. Mr. Wakeling. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and Director Wasley. Um, I do have a PowerPoint presentation here. If uh, it's all possible to get it pulled up. There we go. Um, as Director Wasley mentioned, um, we we exceeded quite a uh, milestone this year. Um, Twelve thousand bighorn sheep in the state. Um, a pretty pretty tremendous uh, success story. A real testimony to uh, the the organizations, uh, the agencies, the personnel. That have been involved with it. Um, staff specialist Mike Cox took the time to put this together and he had some assistance from Tim Herrick in the uh, diversity and um, and so I've, I'm going to try and operate this thing. It's a little anything staff specialist Cox does tends to be fairly detailed and involved and so hopefully I can make this operate without uh, too much trouble. But <clears throat> We want to talk about you know what the success looked like and why we why we consider this such a success. If you look at uh, 
what Nevada had in 1960, um, and there's there's quite a few uh, populations. Many of them are you know centered around the Vegas area, um, but it 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 really was kind of a low point. Probably the 30s and the 40s were kind of a low point for uh, bighorn sheep. The 1900s were right at the turn of the century. It was pretty much a a low point for wildlife uh, nationwide. <clears throat> um, and in many ways, uh, bighorn sheep are kind of a flagship of the uh, re restoration story, the restoration success. Um, we started looking around the state, started looking for places um, where, you know, bighorn sheep were historically and where they weren't in the 1960s. Um, there's a lot of beautiful places. Um, you know, the East Humboldt's up in uh, the northeastern part of the state, or if you go up on the Sheldon in the uh, northwestern part of the state, uh, both of those areas um, kind of, again, emblematic of habitat that at one time had sheep, did not have sheep um, at the time of this. Some of these are, are not currently as inhabited as well as we'd like them to be. Um, but there was a lot of things that kind of played into it, and a lot of ideas that kind of went into how do we restore wildlife habitat? How do we get uh, species back to places where they once occurred and they once were very common? Um, the whole concept of trap and transplant was an idea that came up um, in the 1950s. You know, how the idea of catching wild animals and relocating them and doing it successfully, consistently. In this day and age, we don't think twice about it. We schedule um, captures. We know it's going to happen. We've got the technology, but in that day, um, all the work, all the, all the groundwork had to be led, had to be developed. Um, and then starting to look at why, why were those species extirpated from those areas? It's real easy to say um, unregulated uh, removal through shooting or hunting or poaching um, is what removed them, but there's a lot of things that happen to those habitats that we have to mitigate. Um, there's interstates, there's roadways, there's developments. Um, I, one of the things that just amazes me when you start to look at habitat and wildlife uh, throughout Nevada, the places where the wildlife really seem to like are the same place the people really seem to like. You know, there's a lot in common we have, and oftentimes those developments are what challenge um, those, those, the existence of those species. And so I, populations become isolated. They become separated from water sources. And so development of new water sources that will support those wildlife species becomes very important. And here in the Virginias, this is a, a photograph of the evidence that the bighorn sheep do take advantage of these things. Uh, they're certainly not the only species that do. The many species benefit from them. If we look at this historically, um, since 1967, we've moved over 2,000 bighorn sheep, desert bighorn sheep, uh, almost another 1,000 California bighorns, and Rocky Mountains, we've moved about 326. 3,332 bighorn sheep, 64 different mountain ranges. I mean, when you start looking at the effort that goes into that, it's just tremendous. But it sure shows the benefit, too. Um, when we look at the number of sheep transplanted over time, uh, these are the, the green bars that you see on the screen. Um, despite the fact that we've had periods in years when we've moved an awful lot, we've seen population growth continue even in the years when we don't move very many. Looking at that population of 12,000, over 10,000 of them are desert bighorn sheep. And then uh, there's another almost 2,000 of Californias, and there's just a few hundred uh, Rocky Mountains in the state at this time. But it's, it's a huge milestone. And uh, Staff Specialist Cox was kind of working on the uh, quota tables this year and kind of putting together the, the big game status book, and that's when he recognized we hit this milestone. But we're still not where we were in the 1860s. <clears throat> Nevada doesn't look like it did in the 1860s. It's, it's unreasonable to think that we're going to get to where we were in the 1860s. It's kind of a little bit of a stark contrast when you look at the 1960s, and if you didn't think about where we were in the 1860s, and I'll just a real quick go back to that, this was what we thought we had in the 60, 1860s, 100 years later. However, 
things are looking an awful lot better today. And we're very pleased with where we're going and the progress we've made. Um, one of the things that's pretty amazing is if you look at this map, um, the pink populations that you see on the graph, those are remnant or they were never extirpated. They were always here. Um, if you look at the, uh, um, the blue, these are populations that have been reintroduced uh, through our efforts. And then um, there's also those yellow populations there. Those have pioneered uh, sometimes as a result of our reintroductions and sometimes from existing populations. Um, but those populations have managed to make a comeback just with the protections that have been put, place, put in place uh, by the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners and the department. Now, here's where we get a little techie. I want to share just a little bit of kind of a time lapse series and see if I can get this to work. Um, and what this shows is um, a period of time st starting back in the 1960s. And these red dots, uh, this indicates where we've made a release. The green dots indicate where a capture occurred. And so even early on, you know, tomorrow you're going to be asked to consider a translocation to a couple of other uh, tribes, Native American tribes, um, but that's nothing new. That's something that the, the department and the commission have been involved with for a long time. You can see in a lot of places we've moved uh, things in, uh, interstate to assist, and we benefit from, from the work that we do with them. And this is a time lapse just going over time. We're in 72 start to see some of these translocations popping up around. Um, now we're into the mid, getting into the 80s. And you can see that we're getting sheep from a lot wide variety of areas too. Here we are in 1992, moving into the uh, late 90s now. And you can see that um, you know, by the time we get here, you can see that we've received sheep, Alberta, um, we've received sheep from Colorado, Wyoming, and other states, Utah uh, and California have benefited from our translocations as well. And so it's pretty, pretty amazing and it's a pretty amazing success story. Um, and I'd just like to conclude by um, sharing a couple of things. One is that um, Mike Cox has, has uh, made a great effort to try and capture some of this. And uh, within the next week or two, uh, the Nevada Bighorns Unlimited, uh, their journal will be coming out with an article that he's put together um, that he'll be sharing um, some of the successes and some of the stories from some of the people that were involved in that success story, um, the, their perceptions, the work they did. And I'd also like to share one other thought, and despite the fact that we're at a, a tremendously better place than we were in the 1960s, um, restoration, like the North American model, has to continue to evolve, has to keep adapting. We have to keep changing and doing things different. Um, a lot of things in uh, um, American culture, we like to use sports analogies. And um, this is uh, something that Mike and I wrote in the last... Uh, trophy book, um, but you know, you, you talk about people, talk to people who are involved in sports and they like to argue about what the most difficult thing to do consistently well. Um, one of them is a really good golf swing or maybe it's getting a really good fastball across the diamond or you know, whatever it may be. Um, but I heard a really plausible argument one time that the hardest thing to do is to go into uh, halftime in the Super Bowl and try and convince your team that you need to change the strategy that you'd use to get there. The strategy you're working needs to change and there's so many aspects of what we're doing now that has been so successful for so long that we need to adapt uh, to, in order to keep uh, dealing with some of those successes or fostering those successes and keep them going. And I, that kind of concludes my portion of this. I'd like to turn it over to uh, uh, Matt now and uh, allow him to kind of talk about some of those uh, successes and some of the adaptions that they're using. Well, 
Welcome, Mr. Maples. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the Water Development Program, and I'm going to start with um, kind of the infancy of the program and how it contributed to the success of the Bighorn Sheep Restoration Program into Nevada and, and how we got to, to 12,000 sheep. Um, and then about halfway through, I'm going to transition and talk a little bit about what that program <laughs> led to as far as water development uh, throughout other parts of Nevada and other species, and then I'll conclude with some of the findings that we've had over the years as far as the, the vast array of benefits um, far exceeding um, benefits to bighorn sheep that these water developments have had, had across the state. And so in the beginning, um, water developments have been constructed in, in Nevada by, by dedicated sportsmen that saw the need to help desert bighorn sheep and the then Nevada Fish and Game Commission starting in about the 1950s. Um, many of these units were, were placed on, on BLM ground uh, and other areas, uh, specifically in the southern part of the state. Um, very prominent uh, sportsman's organization, Fraternity of the Desert Bighorn, was responsible for leading a lot of the initial charges uh, towards establishing water developments. And as Brian indicated, with uh, translocating bighorn sheep, um, certainly we have it down a lot better today than we did in the early stages. So there are designs that have been modified and improved over the course of the last uh, many, many decades of, of running this program. Um, the initial water developments, uh, they were installed to increase population distribution of desert bighorn sheep when these species were at, at an all-time low. And they were really very uh, essential to the translocation program. Um, these early successes uh, were realized. Uh, bighorn sheep numbers were increasing. Water developments, along with many other uh, initiatives, were, were responsible for uh, many successes on bighorn sheep restoration, both in increasing population sizes and also increasing distribution throughout the state. Um, typically, water developments, especially in uh, the early years and also uh, more recently in northern Nevada, water developments were installed in drier mountain ranges prior to uh, trap and transplant of bighorn sheep. And so approximately 80% of the desert bighorn sheep releases were, were completed after water developments were successfully installed and then had time to charge and fill with water. And so these desert bighorn sheep and later um, California bighorn sheep were placed in areas where we had good quality water, um, where we had water development specifically designed for wildlife, um, and they had their own kind of individual place where we knew they could obtain sustainable water sources. Approximately 50% of the California bighorn sheep releases were predicated upon installation of water developments in the northern part of the state. Graph shows uh, the number of desert bighorn sheep or uh, water developments targeting desert bighorn sheep installed in Nevada. As you can see, the 1980s and the 1990s uh, were certainly a period of rapid expansion of water development in the southern Nevada, which is in the, the blue portion of the bar, uh, and that corresponds pretty well with the high number of translocations that occurred during the 80s and 90s as well. Uh, northern Nevada, um, installations in that portion of the state increased a little bit later, um, and then those were primarily targeting some of our more northern desert bighorn sheep herds in the central and, and western portions of the state. Uh, the, the units are, there's 202 water developments in the state that target bighorn sheep um, of the three subspecies. Uh, 176 of those target desert bighorn sheep um, highlighted in yellow, 24 target California bighorn sheep in brown, and two of them target Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep in green. Uh, soon the benefit to wildlife of these water developments was realized and, and the program gradually expanded to target other species uh, such as antelope, elk, chucker, uh, mule deer, and even sage grouse. 
uh, as part of this, water development designs were modified. Um, their placement was changed. Uh, we started looking at uh, elk habitat, pronghorn habitat, and uh, chucker habitat for sites of new water developments. Uh, this graph shows uh, the rate of water development or the number of water developments installed by decade uh, for the entire state to include both large and small volume units. Um, and certainly the number of small volume units that typically target upland game birds such as chucker is, is quite a bit higher than a big game unit. And there was a rapid period of expansion in the 80s and 90s. Uh, largely it's tapered off uh, most recently. Um, it's certainly not that we're any less focused on the program, but simply that the program has evolved a little and many of the mountain ranges uh, where there were not reliable sources of natural water or natural water had been adversely impacted by some other use and a water development was used to, to recreate that water source. These areas were essentially built out and are now have adequate supply throughout the range that we are targeting. And that's kind of how we got to this map. And so the light blue dots are small water or small volume guzzlers and the dark blue are large game units. Um, as of earlier this year, we had approximately 1,743 water developments statewide. Um, it's quite a substantial number compared to some of the early years in the 50s when we were starting with, you know, perhaps uh, 50 units or 40 units uh, specifically in the southern part of the state. <coughs> 451 of these are, are big game units and 1,292 of them are small game units. And in many of the areas where uh, you, you see gaps in the map, there's sufficient perennial and natural water sources to support wildlife. And then obviously in the areas where the dots are more densely um, located are, are naturally dry ranges or ranges where uh, creation of wildlife specific water sources was considered beneficial and has uh, largely um, accounted for a lot of the, the wildlife resources that we have today. And so how did we get here? How did we end up with 1,743 units? Uh, largely it was on uh, due to a lot of dedicated volunteers, thousands of dedicated volunteers that represent many committed uh, sports and conservationist organizations and many other organizations. And so we've, we have a very robust volunteer program uh, that's largely credited with supporting the water development program for the state. Um, each year volunteers in concert with Endow coordinate and help construct um, a large number of units both in southern and northern portions of the state. It's been very, very successful. Um, each year we'll have hundreds of unique volunteers uh, come out to these projects and help with the construction. It's a great way for folks to get involved, uh, invest a little bit of blood, sweat, and tears into their wildlife resources, and also uh, provide a benefit to wildlife. And there are a lot more than, than just manpower. Uh, this funded is, or this program, the War Development program is 75% funded by Pittman Robertson grants and 25% funded by state match. And so um, for every $1 of in-kind funds, we get $3 from the Pittman Robertson grant. And in the case of this program specifically, those in-kind funds uh, are largely um, contributions from volunteers. And that can be in the case of hours of running a shovel or a digging bar and showing up to a water development project site to help with the construction to the tune of just over 4,200 hours in 2017. Uh, it can be the miles that they drive going from you know, their home to the project site and back uh, to the tune of just over 82,000 miles for 2017. Uh, we count the tools that they bring or the tools that they provide as part of their contribution. And then we also count cash or non-cash equivalent contributions. And so if they provide a donation to a specific guzzler uh, if they rent equipment that we're lacking or that we need to help build on a specific site. Um, all of that is considered in-kind match for this program and helps us essentially run a million dollar program while spending less than 2% uh, or less than 2% of the entire program's budget based off of sportsman dollars. And so it's largely the, the benefit of the volunteers and their dedication to the program cannot be understated. It's one of the few programs that Endow operates 
that's largely entirely funded uh, without the use of any state funds. Um, so when we go to site or place a water development, uh, certainly in the early years, um, likely took more of a shotgun approach. There was opportunity everywhere, and so uh, picking a location uh, had to be strategic, but with so much uh, ground that did not have water developments on, the chances of success were really high. As we've gone forward, we've become much more strategic in how we place these units. Uh, we look for areas where we're trying to enhance wildlife habitat, where there's where natural water sources are either limited or unreliable. Uh, we'll oftentimes use them as, or use a water development to mitigate an anthropogenic development project, such as a mine, uh, that may reduce uh, the use of wildlife on a spring site, or use uh, guzzlers to draw wildlife away from a mine site so they're not uh, seeking the free water that those projects often generate. And then we'll also use them to, to alleviate competition with domestic livestock and wild horses by providing a place for wildlife um, that's solely for wildlife uh, where they can always obtain reliable source of water. As far as the annual workload of the program, uh, we typically install eight to 10 new units. Uh, as you can imagine, with over 1,700 water developments in the state right now, uh, ongoing maintenance is probably one of our primary concerns for this program, and so we rebuild or perform major maintenance on 40 to 50 units per year, and then each year we inspect as many units either from the air or from the ground as we possibly can, and we'll typically inspect and perform minor maintenance on around 300 units, if not a few more, depending on uh, flight conditions. And then we'll use trail cameras to monitor wild, wildlife use on 15 to 20 units. Typically, we'll uh, focus our monitoring efforts on brand new units or units that were defunct and then have been rebuilt just to ensure that the current design that we've used is, is adequate and the animals are crossing the fence as well and using the placement of the guzzlers in a satisfactory manner. And so a, a lot of times it's to document first use of the site and then to also better understand uh, improvements to our design uh, that we can use in the future. And what we've seen um, through some of this monitoring is although the program certainly started uh, targeting desert bighorn sheep and then grew into a variety of other wildlife species, the benefits to a lot of our diversity species and the other hundreds of wildlife species uh, that we have in Nevada is also well documented at these sites. And so we've seen bats use them. We've seen a variety of, of large and small predators use the water, the water developments. Um, a number of birds, uh, both raptors, migratory birds, um, owls, golden eagles, small mammals, um, sage grouse, I mean, the site, some of the sites have been targeted to benefit sage grouse, and we've had proven successes in supplying that species with water as well. Uh, in some of the units, we've even documented frogs and, and tadpoles, and so there's, there's quite an unbelievable response when you provide reliable water in a desert ecosystem or a dry ecosystem. A lot of the species are certainly there. And in many cases, these units just allow those species to express themselves and become uh, more abundant on the landscape. With that, I'd offer up for any questions. Questions for Mr. Maples? Commissioner Hubbs. One of the questions that came to my mind was um, just historically, was there a lot more groundwater or springs? What I'm thinking is perhaps over time, has, a, has the water the use of water due to, you know, man-made issues changed the landscape so that it was harder for desert bighorn, and so these guzzlers augment that, or I don't know if they're, or or if the, if that's what caused the decline in numbers in general. Um, from, the, from the 1860s to the 1960s, when you looked at the data that Mr. Wakeling showed, we had a lot of um, distribution of the um, sheep, and then over time, obviously, very reduced islands kind of down south and just a couple in the middle. Um, and then we've been doing these water augmentations, and it just makes me wonder if that's, if the change in groundwater in some capacity had something to do with that decline. I would certainly offer that the dramatic decline in bighorn sheep from the 1800s to the mid-1900s was most likely uh, not related to uh, 
uh, loss of groundwater or surface expression of springs. It was related to a variety of other issues, um, over-harvest, over uh, anthropogenic development, um, disease issues with domestic livestock all likely played a role in, in those declines. Um, certainly with the uh, increasing human population in Nevada, we've certainly seen areas where springs no longer seem to produce the amount of water that you would have expected. And so there have been cases where we'll use water developments to try to augment that. Um, as far as uh, on a statewide scale, there's so much diversity in Nevada's landscape that, you know, I can't say that that's uh, always the the primary driver for locating water development, but they've certainly been uh, very helpful in, in bringing back sheep to a lot of mountain ranges. Further questions? Seeing none, I want to thank you gentlemen for the presentation and everyone else that was involved in putting it together. Thank you. With that, we'll close agenda item number 15. We'll move to agenda item number 16, Commission General Regulation Workshop, public comment allowed. And uh, while I'm thinking about it here, anyone that comments on this from the public, would we please fill out the green card for us? With that, we'll move to Commission General Regulation 472, License Simplification, LCB file number R029-17, Data and Technology Services Division Administrator Chet Vandellen. Workshop public comment allowed. The commission will hold a workshop to consider and recommend amendments to chapters 488, 501, 502, and 504 of the Nevada Administrative Code. This regulation is designed to implement the hunting and fishing license simplification structure approved during the 79th legislative session in Senate Bill 511. Mr. Vandellen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. My name is Chet Van Dallen, for the record. I guess if you write a nice summary on your agenda, you don't have much to introduce. <laughs> so we're here to do a workshop on the proposed permanent regulations for Nevada Administrative Code that will implement the license simplification structure drafted in Senate Bill 511 of uh, the 79th session of the Nevada legislature. If you turn to your support material, we've tried to summarize uh, each change to NAC that is, it was proposed by the department and then um, drafted by the Legislative Commission. The actual text of the changes to NAC is over 115 pages long, so I'll refrain from reading all that right now. <laughs> but if you have any questions, we can go over these one by one and address any concerns you may have, and then I guess we turn it over to public comment and go from there. Okay. Thank you, Chad. I, I know the department has put a tremendous amount of time in this. And uh, I've read through quite a bit of it, but I had I wanted to see if there's any questions from the commission, but I think it, we'll look at it as though we're going to go with what the department has unless there's specific questions. We've had it we've had it for a couple weeks to look at and see if we can make that work a little smoother and instead of having Chet sit there and read through 100 and <laughs> however many pages it was, 43 or something. And just to clarify, th this is the final product of everything we've addressed on numerous prior public meetings on license simplification. So Correct. it's not as though it's something new. Uh, for the cl clarification, some of the things um, are addressed in statute, which is not up for workshop. This is just the regulations for NAC. So, Questions for Chet? Commissioner Hubs. Just to clarify, we're, so basically each one of these uh, code, you know, code sections that are listed at it are just areas slated for re updating verbiage to reflect the new licensing program that we've all gone over several times, right? Correct. Deputy Director Rob. We made a conscious effort in our review of all the NACs. We came across things that we knew we needed to change. But if it wasn't related to license simplification, we did not touch those at this time. So 100% of what you see is a result of license simplification. Even though there was other things we'd like to take care of, we left them alone for another day. Thank you, Mr. Rob. Questions from the commission? 
Okay. We'll take it out to public comment then. Mr. Chair, Commission, uh, for the record, Jana Wright, resident of Clark County. During the many discuss discussions on license simplification, I heard the department talk of reducing licenses from 27 to about eight, making things easier for the client, the change would be revenue neutral, and the goal was to make licensing simpler, more efficient, and modern. I believe the regulation does that, and I support those changes. What I didn't hear during these discussions and during the 2017 legislative process was adding moose to the list of animals that requires a tag. Basically setting the stage for adding moose as a big game mammal, <coughs> excuse me, in this regulation. I am disappointed in the department for not bringing this up in the spirit of transparency. But the ultimate blame is on me for not going through Senate Bill 511 with a fine-tuned comb. I've learned my lesson and will be more diligent in the future. In my opinion, this would be a perfect time to remove the black bear from the list of big game mammals. And I would ask the commission con to consider this request as you discuss the regulation before you today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Further public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the commission. Comments or questions from the commission? Well, this one's simpler than I thought it would be. Simplification. <laughs> I would like to say uh, real quickly, again, Chet Van Dalen, for the record, uh, we do appreciate that this timeline is very compressed. Uh, I know the commission doesn't like to do a workshop back to back with the uh, hearing. We do appreciate that. We are trying to meet the Legislative Council, uh, Commission's calendar and then implement these changes for our uh, January of this year. So we do appreciate that. Vice Chairman Johnston. I guess that was a comment I was going to make because I know that the cabs have expressed concern, especially the cabs on that issue. And one thing is I can understand the timeline we're under. And two, given the amount of uh, prior discussion in public meetings over this process before it was even taken to the legislature. I feel it's quite comfortable under these particular facts to have workshop today in the second reading tomorrow. I agree, Vice Chairman. Okay, further comments from the commission? Uh, do we need a motion to have the second reading tomorrow or just, do we just move forward with the second reading tomorrow? No, I believe we just, just move forward shop. with Brian Stockton for the record. Yeah, without any changes, I think we just move forward. Further questions or comments on agenda item number 16? Okay, Commissioner Hubs. So just in light of um, some of the comments made by the public and Ms. Wright in particular in regard to the moose, so with the new legislation, we added moose um, under NRS, correct? And so we're just adding the regulation to reflect that within the license simplification program because it's not there, it's not existing. Thank you, Chairman Wallace. Uh, I'll take the first crack at this, and I think Deputy Director Rob may have some input as well. So uh, we've recognized that we have pioneering moose moving into Nevada. Historically, uh, it would be an occasional yearling bull. Um, however, more recently, what we've seen is cows and calves. And at the time that the bill uh, language was assembled, went to the legislature, we did not know that we had as many moose as we presently know that we have. So this winter, uh, the biologist conducting elk surveys in those areas uh, classified in excess of, of 30 moose, which uh, if you're going to classify, you go going from virtually zero to 30 in that one year period, um, made it clear to us that we had a, a growing moose population. Uh, because of the challenges in amending language when you have something like this open, uh, 
it is far more effective and efficient to accomplish as much of those changes as you can when that, when that process is open. So this was uh, never intended to uh, lack transparency. This is not an underhanded effort to not disclose a future effort or attempt to hunt moose in Nevada. However, it does recognize that we have a growing population of moose and at some future point they may be abundant enough to provide some recreational opportunity and it's most efficient and prudent to try to take care of that when this opportunity presents itself. So I, I thank you for the question and I think uh, Deputy Director Rob may have additional comments on that issue. Mr. Rob. Jack Rob for the record and uh, another thing uh, listing it as a big game animal uh, gives us some more laws uh, when accidents occur. Uh, the past two years during the cow elk season, we've had cow moose harvested once in the, uh, each of the last two years, and they're not classified as any type of animal in the state of Nevada, so what do you write on a citation at that point? So classifying this big game animal clears up some uh, things for law enforcement also. Thank you, Mr. Rob. Vice Chairman Johnston. That would give the protection to the moose explicitly because it's unlawful to take a big game mammal without a tag. So by including the moose into the definition, they're now expressly protected uh, being classified as such. That is correct. And you will see that it's become an issue the past couple of years. So we've been proactive this year uh, with the uh, presence of wolves in Nevada and the presence of moose in Nevada. If you look at your hunting guides, they both now have pictures uh, trying to explain the differences between a cow elk and a cow moose and a coyote and a wolf. So we were taking proactive approaches to uh, tell people they may be out there and to recognize what you're shooting and identify your target. So we're taking steps to get there also. Thank you, any further questions from the commission? Okay, seeing no further questions, thank you, Mr. Van Dellen, and we will uh, close agenda item number 16 and move to agenda item number 17, public comment period. Persons wishing to speak are requested to complete a speaker's card and present it to the recording secretary. Public comment will be limited to three minutes. No action can be taken by the commission at this time. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. Public comment period. Come on up. Hello, I'm Stephanie Myers from Las Vegas for the record. Another Wildlife Commission meeting. Oh good, now how can I participate in that? I isn't that the response that you would like the public to have when you announce when your meetings are gonna be? Why not let the Wildlife Commission set the standard for public participation by easy video conferencing between North and South, the two major population centers of the state. Here's what sticks out like a sore thumb for me. The number of people showing up should not be any kind of issue in regards to having access to facilities, whether it's two or 10 or more people. If only two or three show up, there should instead be a discussion about how can we get more participation here. Wildlife Commission meetings should be based on the purpose of getting people involved in improving things in Nevada, any and all people. And a low turnout would prompt a discussion for how to improve attendance and not an excuse to not facilitate participation. It really does make it look like some people don't want a broader participation or representation, especially concerning the question of how has the commission failed to do anything about this for such an extended period of time? It's been hit or miss for years now. When there's a big issue, then there's a big public response. Uh, as tomorrow, there may be a big public response for commercial reptile collection. But there are an awful lot of people in the north who would really like to testify in front of you, and they can't. There's no video conferencing. All they can do is send you a letter. 
The public needs to see genuine transparency and public participation as a priority among all public uh, governmental agencies and functions. If we can raise room taxes uh, to build a football stadium, why can't Nevada governmental agencies like the Wildlife Commission put the public and the public's needs first? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Myers. Further public comment? Good afternoon. For the record, Fred Volz. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service issues its preliminary lift findings last month from the 2016 National Survey of Fishing, Hunting, and Wildlife Associated Recreation Study. As with the last survey, the chasm between wildlife watching activities such as observing, feeding, and photographing wildlife versus hunting has grown in the five years from 2011 to 2016. Expenditures for hunting activities fell off a cliff, statistically speaking. They dropped from 36 million and change in, billion and change in 2011 to only 25 billion and change, or a decline of 29%. Conversely, wildlife watching expenditures rose 28% from 59 billion in 2011 to 75, almost 76 billion in 2016, or an increase of 28%. Thus, there is almost a three to one advantage in economic activity and spending for the wildlife watching uh, contingent versus the hunting segment. Wildlife watching had 86 million participants versus only 11.5 million for hunting on a national basis, or al almost eight times the participation rate. Yes, the times are indeed changing as more and more people vote with their wallets and feet to respect wildlife in its natural setting rather than kill as much as it, of it as they possibly can for amusement and self-aggrandizement. State wildlife commissions around the country, including this one, still have not selected this, not have uh, respected this societal shift in the policies and practices they adopt. Failure to do so in the future will increasingly lead to such commission's irrelevance and removal for not reflecting the majority's will and the best interests of wildlife species. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bowles. Further public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll close agenda item number 17 and we will adjourn for the day, returning tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. Thank you.